You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me today. I have uh, an excellent show for you. I know uh, one of my favorite writers, uh, Will Dean, has really come on the scene in the last couple of years with some dynamic books, um, things that are taking some of the thriller tropes that we love and absolutely turning them on their head. Uh, his last few books have been amazing, and uh, I, I just love everything you're doing, Will. Um, your new book, Firstborn, uh, comes out July 5th, and it will blow your socks off. Um, I've had the privilege of reading this book early, and I know everyone else that gets their hands on it uh, next week, as, from when we're recording now, uh, is absolutely going to love this book. Um, welcome back to the show, Will. Thank you very much, Hank. It's very good to be here, and uh, that's a very kind intro. Thank you. <laughs> You're so welcome. Um, we we chatted. Uh, I guess it was last year or, or a little um, a little longer. Um, and if I remember right, I think we kind of teased what you were working on at the time. You couldn't tell us a whole lot, um, but but you let us know that that there was something really cool coming. Um, Firstborn, how long have you been working on this book? I think all in, it takes me normally about three years to write each book, even though the first drafts take about four weeks. So this one took four weeks, the first draft, but um, it takes me a while to rewrite it. I, I tend to rewrite my books over and over and over again to the point where I'm losing all grip on reality. And then it's kind of time to send it to my editor. Um, so this one, I did three research trips to New York. Wow. Um, I, I was I was going to ask you um, about um, because we're in this book, we're we're dealing with two characters uh, primarily. And and one of them lives in New York. And the the way that you um, kind of painted New York uh it, 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 I, I had to ask you, you know, had you recently been there? Because th there's just so much detail and, and you, you really put a lot of love and care into building the world for us, so to speak. Um, so w when you take a research trip like that, what, what sorts of things are you looking for um, that you can include in the story? You know, some people, when they do their quote unquote world building, um, they just include so many facts and figures and you're just like, OK, I get it. You've been there. That's that. That's great. But it's it's the little subtle things that make you feel um, a place. And it's not just, OK, Will's just trying to prove to us that he's been there. Like what sorts of things do you look for that will help uh, a reader really get into the setting? Well, that's the funny thing, because normally I write these miserable, dark, twisted kind of rural noir novels where <laughs> they're set in a little fictional farmhouse or in a forest. And I don't get to do any fun like business travel and expense it. And my accountant, you know, has nothing to do. But with this one, I was like, I'm going to make the most of this. I need to write New York authentically. So I, I traveled there three times from my Swedish forest and uh, I could expense it all, which was fantastic. And what I wanted to do was see all the little things that people the tourists maybe miss you know i wanted to smell the smells in the middle of the night in certain places and i wanted to walk the book so i actually like most days i did about twenty five thousand steps one day i did twenty nine thousand. i just walked up and down manhattan island trying to see the place from molly raven's point of view from an outsider's point of view because i knew i couldn't write new york from a new yorker perspective i don't know the city that well but I can write New York from a, like a Londoner's perspective, because that's kind of me. So much like myself, Molly is overwhelmed when she's in New York by the expense, by the noise, by the verticality of the city, by the claustrophobia. And I wanted to get that across on the page. And I also wanted to kind of convey some of the, the quieter moments and places in New York and the little like the dialogue, little snippets of dialogue that I overheard of people, customers talking to 
the guys who are working on the food trucks on the intersections and that kind of thing. So I wanted to get those smells right and those feels right. It's difficult to put your finger on it, but it's not something you can read in a guidebook. It's something I think where you have to be there and just kind of sit in Central Park and watch people for hours and hours and hours. So wh- when did you first get the idea for this book? And and, and I'll just tell um, the listeners that um, in this book, and you can set it up for us if you want, but um, we're we're dealing with a subject matter that, that I think is ripe for all sorts of stories. Um, identical twins and identical twins, if you don't know, um, are – uh, you know, begin their life as as one egg uh, or one fertilized egg that splits in two. And and so you've got the closest of characters, I mean, literally back to their very beginnings, um, that, that I, I think is just fertile for all sorts of stories. So when did this first idea kind of come to you? I think I've, I've wanted to write identical twins for a very long time just because I find them fascinating. I've, I like writing characters and place very much. So if you like writing characters and getting really in deep in the psychology of characters, there's nothing more fascinating than siblings and then twins and then identical twins is like the ultimate. So I had the idea about three years ago. I saw in my mind's eye like almost a global picture. I saw these two twins on the phone to each other. One is in London. Molly, Molly Raven. She's terrified of life. She's very anxious. She's very like risk calculating all the time. Her apartment is full of fire alarms on fire extinguishers. And she was on the phone to her identical twin, Katie, living in New York, traveling around, being on holiday, being in relationships, studying at Columbia, having a very full life. And I guess I related more to <laughs> to Molly Raven, who's, who's in London. <laughs> But I just thought it was fascinating how you could have two identical twins who have who look obviously exactly the same, but they have a very different uh, personality. And I wondered how that might result in some kind of resentment in later life because of how they're treated differently as kids. And this comes back to a barbecue I went to five years ago where there were two sisters. One was maybe 10 and one was 12. And the 12 year old sister was extremely serious and quite difficult and shy that's probably how I was when I was that age and the 10 year old sister was really like an entertainer really gregarious and laughing and very friendly and everyone was kind of labeling one as like the difficult sister and one as the fun sister and I just wondered like what does that do to a person especially if you look identical because I'm Mm -hmm. guessing the fun one is always a little bit like actually (laughs) <laughs> I can be serious too, like take me seriously. And the, the, right. and the difficult one is that I, I can have a good time. So I wanted to see how that um, would manifest in later life. And I think with all anybody who's a sibling or who knows siblings, sibling relationships are complicated. Even, even if you're super close, there's a lot of like deep rooted psychology there that goes down to childhood. So I wanted to tap into that. Well, and and you alluded to it a minute ago, and and I don't think this is giving too much away because it's it's in the first couple of pages of the book. Um, Molly is so risk averse. Um, you even go into talking about how she charges her cell phone, and and to the point that you know there uh, she only does it and not on a flammable surface and only where there's a um, a fire extinguisher close by. Like like, like you really go into um, a lot of detail in, in kind of giving us a glimpse into what makes her tick. Um, you know, and it, we talk about kids and, um, uh, kind of this idea of nature versus nurture, you know, is it, is it who you are at your core from the beginning or is it how you were raised and the people you were around and your, uh, your atmosphere, and, and sometimes you can have two people that have the exact same life experience and they just are very different. Um, w- were you thinking about those sorts of things when, when you're kind of sketching out the story? I really was. And the, the research part of this book, apart from all the traveling, was I was listening to a lot of podcasts with identical twins or reading blogs by identical twins. And it was so fascinating, especially some of the really niche, small podcasts, you know, two twins just talking for hours and, and they were saying like um, what two of them were saying that they can't they've never really touched each other. They've never hugged or like t- patted ones, the other one's arm because it just would feel too weird. And that's quite extreme. But I found that so interesting that if you're looking at someone who is, 
you know, almost like a replica of yourself. It's kind of disconcerting to actually touch that other person. And uh, something else that actually went in the book, one of the twins was saying that she was so shocked one day when her sister, her twin, was wearing an outfit that she had bought for herself. And they haven't they hadn't talked about these outfits. And then suddenly she saw her twin wearing this particular dress and she saw what she looks like wearing that. And she could never wear it again because like for the first time she could see exactly how she looks, not like in some well lit mirror in a dressing room, but exactly how it moves when she moves. And I just thought that was so interesting and something that for me as a non twin, like I, I never really thought about those things until I started going deep in the research. So let, let's take a sidebar for just a moment, because you, you mentioned um, a little bit ago um, living in the Swedish forest and, and those uh, listeners who might not know all of your story. You you live in a cabin in the Swedish forest about as off grid as anyone um, that I can imagine. Um, how did how did that come about? Just it, it, just kind of tell our readers sort of your story there and then um you know, when when you are writing a new story and you are, uh, you know, a lot of writers work from home and, and you know, have a, a sort of solitary existence, but but you kind of amp that up uh, to the nth degree. Um, how does that affect your, your creativity and the stories that you tell, do you think? It's a good question. So, yeah, I'm from a little blue collar town in the Midlands of the UK, um, went to study in London, met my Swedish wife in London when I was 18. And she was a little older and we lived in a tiny little one bed apartment in London for 15 years. We couldn't really, you know, scraping by to afford rent. And then after 15 years, we were like, let's let's try and live in the wilderness. Or rather, I was like, let's try and live in the wilderness. And and she wanted to move back to Sweden. So we decided to try and build a place in the woods, in the forest and live off, live partly off the land and uh, have like a very low cost, simple, old fashioned life, which is Low cost life is good when you're starting out being a writer. So it, it was, a, I think it was a good move. And we, I mean, we're in true wilderness. We've got moose and wolves here. Uh, I can walk a full day in any direction. I'm still in the same forest. We don't really see people here. And it's, uh, it is a, a life of few distractions. You know, I do travel a lot doing book festivals and interviews and things. Um, I'm going away, I think the week after next. Uh, to the UK for a, for a tour so that part is kind of weird because I'm so it's so quiet here and right now we have the midnight sun it's over midsummer so it doesn't get dark I can go out out of my wooden cabin in like midnight 1am and walk around the forest like it's an afternoon which is really strange I'm still not used to that yet um, and then going suddenly going to London or New York or Hong Kong is weird. It takes me a few days to acclimatize. I'm I'm kind of in awe of like overstimulated. And then when I'm done, I go back to the forest, have like a day to unwind, and then I'm back into the books. And yeah, I do. It's it's a good place to read and write here because you can kind of be a kid again. You know, there's not there's not there's no shops, there's no cafes, there's no restaurants, there's no anything. It's just us kind of growing food, chopping wood, taking water from our well. And uh, for me, it's it's more time to read and write. And I think a lot of us struggle with reading time these days. There are so many different things competing for our attention, so many screens. And to be able to like be in the woods and just read more and more and more. I'm a big uh, fan of Stephen King's on writing where he kind of says you can't be half hearted about your reading. You need to really dedicate yourself to your reading if you want to write well and if you want to improve. So this is a good place to do that. When on Twitter, you'll you'll post um, photos of your your bookshelf uh, from time to time with your uh, kind of what you're reading now or, or books that you've recently read that you recommend. And and you have a fantastic bookshelf. That's uh, I think that's the envy of a lot of people. Yeah, well, I'm lucky, you know, one of the perks of being a writer, I never thought I would be a writer. I didn't think people like me could be writers. So I was just a reader until I was in my well into my 30s. And then, you know, I, I'm a full time writer now. I can't, I can't quite believe it. And publishers send me proofs. They send me arcs, and I get like ten, fifteen a week here in the forest. I have to hike two miles to my post box on a stick, and that's where I get all my proofs every day, my arcs. And <laughs> and it's wonderful. You know, it's it's uh, it's great. And I love 
reading debuts and trying to find my next, you know, favorite writers. That's uh, that gives me a lot of joy. I love it. So being um, spending your early life in England and your present life in the Swedish forest and then taking trips to New York for uh, kind of fact finding missions like you did for this book. Um, how do you feel that a sense of place um affects number one you as a writer uh, being from england now living in the swedish forest um and and then the characters that you write how do you how do you feel that that where they are from or where they currently live kind of seeps into uh their character development okay though i mean that's everything for me at the beginning that's what i see i'm a very visual writer i see a character and i see them in a particular place often at a particular time of year. And that's what I'm fascinated in. Like, who is this person? I see them often from above, like an aerial, almost drone kind of perspective. Who is this person? What's their backstory? What do they want out of life? What's troubling them? And where are they? And how does the, the landscape and their character interact? Like, what is, is something stopping them from doing something? Is something overwhelming them? I, that's just where, where I start. And I often see like an image like that that gets my interest in the middle of the night, like just before I fall asleep, I always try and let my mind wander. And usually it's just nonsense and it's not, it's not very useful, but occasionally I'll have an idea and something will, will it, oh, I'll be like, oh, that's something. That's something where I'm interested. I want to follow that person and see who they are. And, you know, when I, when I get on a road like that, it, it's, uh, I know that it's going to take a few years out of my life and I'll be really getting to know that fictional person. And before I start writing anything, I spend about six months visualizing, kind of daydreaming and thinking about that person in, in different scenes and settings. And that slowly crystallizes and becomes real for me. And I layer it up and I think it through every day when I'm driving my truck, when I'm walking my dog. And after six months of that, for me, it feels really authentic. Like I know a lot about that person, a lot of stuff that never gets in the books. And then when I start to write, hopefully it comes out quite authentic because to me they're very vivid and three-dimensional by then yeah you write uh from the female perspective better than just about any writer that i know um you are are not a female um how do you uh, what do you attribute uh the the close connection that you have with these characters that's really kind of you to say i don't know it's difficult for me to answer this because i'm not really sure it's it's I think a lot of it is to do with the fact that everyone who was kind of impressive when I was growing up happened to be a woman, you know, whether it's my mother, my grandmother, my aunt, my sister, like all the people I could rely on who were like the glue who held the family together through really hard times often were the, were the women. And so if I think of a protagonist of a story and I'm open to it being a, a man or a woman or a child, every time I'm very open minded, I it just it's whatever comes to me. I don't like. Uh, force it in any particular direction but often if it's like the hero of my stories it's just often a woman and I think that's because of my upbringing you know the men were interesting and doing their things but they were never like the cement that, that kept things together and kept us um, from like collapsing and falling apart so I think that's probably it I have to credit my mom mainly. Wow when you started thinking about the characters of Molly and Katie, the twins that that this story really revolves around, um, you you talked about uh, you know kind of being around some siblings and watching uh, the dynamic there. When did the the story that that the the plot of this book when did that start to unfold? You know, you're you're thinking about sibling relationships and and kind of the power dynamics of of family. Um, but but how did the you know the the adventure that that they went on how did that start to unfold? Uh, it it came during that six months of thinking it through. So at the beginning, I realized that Molly, this kind of really complicated, anxious person in London, she would have to do the unthinkable for her at least, which is to get on a plane. You know, to use her passport for the first time, get on a plane, fly over to New York. Everything about that is terrifying for her. And she's like looking out for police. She's got knitting needles in her hand luggage. She's researching if she can uh, carry a parachute on the plane. Like this is the level we're at here. She's very, 
She's very complicated in that in that regard. And then I wanted her in New York, morning, uh, trying to like comfort her parents, deal with her parents, and as soon as she's there, overwhelmed as she is by the city, she starts to realize that she never knew her twin as well as she thought she did. And I find that fascinating as well. And that's something that I get from like Patricia Highsmith and reading Muriel Spark and Shirley Jackson is you never know your partners, your siblings, your parents, your kids as well as you think you do. And like I've heard of stories of secrets coming out, you know, almost like in eulogies at funerals and things or in or in the pub after a funeral, because you start to find out stuff that never that you never knew in life. And I just <laughs> I like the idea of Molly being in New York, see, putting this puzzle together. Oh, my God, this is who my sister was. So that's kind of the first half of the book. And then the second half of the book changes tone to some extent. And she starts to kind of grow in confidence and seek revenge on those who had wronged her sister. And that was extremely uh, fun to write because she does it in a very Molly Raven way and very like she wouldn't pick a fight with someone but she's very calculated and she watches like YouTube for CIA tips and stuff and she 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 finds very clever ways to do things very devious ways to do things somebody uh, DM'd me a couple of days ago and said that for them it was like Gillian Flynn meets the talented Mr. Ripley and I like that that's a good uh, <laughs> comparison I think that is a great comparison um you said that that the character did something that was very Molly of them. Um, you you talk about these characters as if they are real people and as if you know them intimately um, to the point that you understand how they will behave. Um, I, I think for some writers, that's that's one of the most difficult things is to get into the head of this character to understand what they're visceral reaction to something would be you know not not their calculated reaction but but how they react to something that comes out of the core of their being um how do you get to know your characters that's a great question um a lot of the work is done and this is going to sound strange again but it's in that visualization stage where every day for six months i force myself not to be in my truck listening to a podcast or a YouTube video or an audio book, which is what I normally love to do when I'm in my truck. But in that period, I'm thinking. I'm thinking through a scene, a key scene, or I'm thinking through a little arc or a side character or the way that Jimmy in the food truck talks to Molly Raven when she's there. I'm thinking it through, and I'm going over and over and over it obsessively because if I go over it a 100 times, I'll chuck out what doesn't work. I'll throw out what doesn't work, and I'll start to – understand them in a much more rounded way and i need that personally because i need the confidence to be able to start writing a first draft and if i haven't done all of that preparatory work and for me that's not writing notes or cvs or characters it's seeing them in my head and and also when i'm in my truck i'll talk in their voice which i probably shouldn't admit to but i drive around <laughs> on my own in the truck and i'll i'll say I'll start talking in their voice and that will help me a lot in understanding how they see the world and how they interact with other characters. So for me, it's just like a lot of layering up. And then I write that first draft extremely quickly because I'm terrified it will fall apart if I don't. And then when I'm done, I put it away for about four months, work on other things. And then when I come back to it, I rewrite it and I rewrite it and I rewrite it and I rewrite it. That's where the real hard work is. Um, and yeah, by the time I'm done, I know, I feel like I know them really, really well. And, uh, I need that. I need to do that because I, I'm not someone who could write a first draft and send it off because I, I need to keep, keep on, uh, chipping away, you know, keep on improving it. That's just the way I can do it. You said that you don't necessarily, uh, sit down and, and go through character notes and CVs and, and that sort of thing. Um, but as you kind of talk out that process and, and get to know them, um, you know, through that process of, of, of speaking in their voice and, and starting to understand how they will perceive things and then respond to things, do you then take notes about those things that you sort of discover? Like, like how do you, like when you when you strike upon something that you're like, oh, that's great. That that's absolutely something that is character defining for them. Um, do you do you make a note of that so that you don't forget it? Like, what is your process of 
of, of kind of gathering all of those little things that go into character and, and holding on to them. That might be a good idea. <laughs> the, <laughs> the thing is, I'm, I'm so um, I'm such a kind of disciple of Stephen King's on writing. So he says, don't don't keep a notebook because it's the best way to hang on to bad ideas. <laughs> and I think that's true. I want a degree of <laughs> fluidity and looseness in the book at that stage. So there's six months before I start a first draft. If it's not good enough for me to remember it or important enough for me to remember it, it deserves to go. So as I keep thinking through those scenes day after day and before I go to sleep, especially, I'll start just kind of close my eyes and I'll think through uh, the midsection of the book or the beginning of Act 3. It, it can change every single time and I want it to be able to change and I don't want anything s stuck there. I don't want anything like, oh, it's, this is so important. It has to stay. If it's important enough, I'll remember it and I'll I'll build on it and I'll see it more vividly. Um, so when it gets to the first draft, no, I haven't got anything written down, but I, I, I know what happens in the story. Um, and then that first draft is t telling myself the entire story for the first time. And then after that, um, if something hasn't stayed, it didn't deserve to stay. So I'm quite, I'm quite ruthless like that. Um, the one of the hallmarks of a great thriller is the the twist and the turn. And you mentioned Jill, uh, Gillian Flynn a little bit ago um, that someone made that comparison, and I think that's an an absolute correct comparison. Um, but you know, after she published Gone Girl, um, there's uh, you know she kind of took that that unreliable narrator and the twist and and elevated it to such an extreme that uh, that it it changed the genre in a lot of ways and also made it very difficult for other authors to to use some of those same tools in their writing um you know because it uh, if if not done well it comes off as as just an, another gone girl knockoff um how do you think about you know how the 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 story is going to pivot and and how you're going to uh keep the the reader you know, um, on their toes and um, sort of, um, you know, not being able to trust where they think they're going. What 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 does the twist mean for you? That is such a good question because twists are uh, um, controversial. And for me, I don't ever plan on a twist. It's not something that I think is integral to any of my stories. It's it's a, it's a nice thing to happen. If it happens organically and suddenly it shocks me and surprises me, then it stays in. But like if, if I write a book where I'm invested in the characters and in the sense of place and in the story and in the theme and there's no twist, I'm still really happy with it. I don't need a twist in any of my books that I write or in, in any of the books that I read. I think you can have a really satisfying thriller without a twist. It just so happens that this one has has some twists in it. And uh, one of them I knew about before. I saw that in the kind of my visualization stage. Uh, another one came to me as I was writing it. And the, the big one came to me maybe three or four days before when I was driving. And suddenly I was like, oh, and I realized <laughs> kind of what the whole book was about. And I hadn't known that before. And um, that was a wild experience that I haven't had before. And I love, I I'm so glad that it was fluid up to that point because I was able to do that. And um, whether it works or not is up for the readers to decide, but it was a roller coaster to write and to edit. <laughs> you might think of, of a twist like that as being um, a, a plot device in, in, in a way that it is um, because you're, you're kind of, you're taking us on this journey and you're, um, taking us places we don't expect to go, but a great twist like that always comes out of character development. It, it always comes from me thinking that I know a character in a certain way and then them doing something that is uh, completely off the rails uh, from what I expect. Uh, how do you, as a writer, when, when you're thinking of, about this scene that you're going to write and how a character is going to behave. Um, is, is there ever a time where you want a character to do something, but then you're worried that, um, that the reader's not going to go along, uh, with you for this part of the journey? Like, like, I, I guess, you know, once you've established trust with the reader, um, how do you allow your characters to do things 
that seem to be out of character while making me as a reader um, believe in what's going on and want to continue down this path with you. If, does that make sense at all? Complete sense. Yeah. And I think the answer to some extent is in your question. It's when you said, you know, if you really believe in those characters, that's the fundamental. It all comes down to character. And if I'm as a reader, if I'm reading a novel and the characters feel real and well rendered and interesting and three dimensional, they don't have to be likable. But if they're kind of real to me, then I'm on board and I don't really care if like not much happens to them or if a huge things happen to them, seismic things happen to them. I'm just interested because I'm interested in human nature and people. And I think most writers are really interested in people. So. Um, I think, you know, thank God I'm not conscious of these things. I'm not thinking what will readers expect when I'm writing ever. I'm a kid again, writing at a frantic pace. Um, and I'm there telling myself that story and I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I've got a buzz when I'm writing a first draft. So the, the key to it all, I think, is to have those characters feel completely real. And by the time I'm writing, a first, you know, if the characters don't feel real to me before I start writing a first draft, then I won't write that first draft. I'll come up with a new idea because it won't work for me. I'm the first writer. I'm the writer and the first reader. So it has to work for me. So, um, yeah, the, it's all about the character development. And for me, it's about like spending a huge amount of time with them before I type a single word. And I have to say, that, like, I stand on the shoulders of all the writers that I admire so much, you know, especially if you're talking about twisty thrillers, you know, people like Dennis Lehane with Shutter Island or uh, or Fight Club or Sharp Objects, Gillian Flynn's Sharp Objects, which has probably got my favorite twist of any twist in there. And Fingersmith by Sarah Waters. So it's uh, I think if you're a writer who wants to write a seismic twist, then you need to be a, a voracious reader. Have have you ever come up with a twist and um, and and think that uh, you know maybe the reader won't go along for this for this twist with me? Um, is, is there ever a time where you you have to adjust a character to make it more palatable for the reader to go along with? Uh, you know, has there has there ever been a situation where you go ah that's a step too far? And then and if so, how do you correct that? There has, yeah. Sometimes when I'm like in the thick of it, in that kind of fever dream flow state of writing a first draft, I'll have a little idea pop into my head like, oh, maybe this. And then as soon as I've had the idea, I will dismiss it. Like, no, that's just not organic. That's just that's just a crazy idea that you've had. That's not going to work. That's not what that character would organically do. Like, that's not natural. So it's, it goes away. And I think when you're writing a first draft, there's probably, you know, 30 ideas like that that pop into your head every day that you have to dismiss and filter out. And sometimes you need a couple of days to like play with it before you realize, no, it doesn't go in. But I think you have to be brutal because if you're not brutal at the first draft stage, you're going to have to just undo all of that work in draft number 11 because you ha it has to go out right to your, to your editor and to bookshop. So you might as well be honest with yourself right at the start, I think. And I think you have to trust your gut and your instinct. Like if there's a twist that's just ridiculous or came out of nowhere, then it's not fun for me as a writer to write that twist. And it will be really, you know, unsatisfying for any for any reader. So it doesn't go in. But it's also a fun challenge, isn't it, to to think, um, you know, the reader's never going to see this coming. Now, it's my job as a writer to to uh to to build this character so that when this does happen, they will believe it, that that it, it will be acceptable to go along uh, with. And then, you know, it's fun that as a reader to get to the end of the book and look back on what you thought about the character from the beginning and then think about where you wind up with the character. That's always a fun reflection. Love that. Yeah. Like if you if you write an interesting sorry, if you read an interesting book like that and then you want to go back and reread it immediately see right. how how the author did it and fit it all together totally agree that can be really really interesting and exciting it's like when you watch sixth sense the sixth sense for the second time you right. see it in a whole different light so yeah for sure i agree with that but i think when it has to come from the character not the plot like if you've got the plot then you have to reverse engineer the characters to fit it it'll never quite be right but i think if you have the characters and then the plot comes out of those characters and you realize what they're really like. 
then it fits then it works so much fun um speaking of the sixth sense you know it, that's one of those twists that um that y- you can never watch that movie again and have the same experience that you had the first time but you can have a different experience with it you you can look for all of the the things that you should have seen the first time or that you did see but didn't know that you should be paying attention to um it, it is rereading a thriller uh, kind of like that like you can never have that first experience again but you can maybe have a richer deeper experience rereading it I think so, but I'm I'm weird. I'm hooked on rereading. You know, I'll reread <laughs> maybe 15, 20 percent of the books I read each year are rereads, and uh, I love rereading great novelists because I see different things with each reread. You know, and I will experience it in a different way just because I'm different to how I was ten years ago. So I'll read it as a different person, and it's. It's I don't know, it's it's a it's a comfort and it's exciting and I learn a lot from rereading. So some books I've reread 15, 20 times and I'm still learning from them. And uh, I'm so grateful to those authors. It, it's kind of funny because the first time you read it, you sort of read it as a fan and, and you're just getting the entertainment experience of it. And then when you reread it, you can almost come as a student and, and you're still enjoying it, but you're you're then kind of dissecting what the writer is doing. And, and that's a, you kind of get a, a craft read from it almost. Absolutely that. Yeah. I love rereading. And uh, I actually talking about Stephen King's on writing. I reread that every year just because it gives me that boost of confidence. You know what he went through, uh, the way he talks about being a writer, it just helps me, helps me to uh, keep going and uh, keep trying to improve. I'm also really inspired by Cormac McCarthy, who, hides away at his right old age in the uh, Santa Fe Institute. And he just, he works like every day on his craft, just trying to write better at his age, having written No Country for Old Men on the Road, he's still working at it. And that is, that is uh, a real inspiration. That, well, that should be a real inspiration for, for writers that come to the craft um, later in life. Um, you know, in, in I, I think we, you know, I, I've met writers who who write phenomenal books in their twenties, and um, you know they're they're just gifted. And and then some people that that have written novels in their forties or fifties, and and it's because of that uh, those observations that they've been able to collect over the decades of their life that that then they're able to write a, a different sort of book. It, it, writing is one of those crafts that. Um, I won't say that you can only grow better at because, you know, the, the things happen, but it's one of those things that you can you absolutely can grow better at the, the longer you do it and the more life experience that you collect. I think so, too. And, you know, it's an important lesson as well in like craft and impatience. Our lives are longer than we think they are. You know, you're 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 doing something. If you're writing, you're gonna, you might be writing for the next 20, 30, 50 years and just incrementally improving working away and screening out the noise the social media the noise screening that out for a portion of each day and focusing on just the the nuts and bolts of writing and the beauty of prose and language and characters it's um it's almost like pretending you're unpublished again for me like i'm almost putting myself in the headspace of will dean 10 15 years ago and i'm just being a reader i'm just obsessive about storytelling and yeah like if I write my best book in 37 years time and everything else is a lead up to that then I'll be delighted it's about a life of of uh, work will the name of this book first born um it, it's it's a book about identical twins um but the title it, it's almost like you're you're telegraphing something to the reader, but it's but it's subtle. It's a it's a a, a subtle message that you're sending. Um, you know the 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 firstborn uh, dynamic in a family is always interesting uh, to see how how kids develop differently from the same family. Um, was there something in particular that you were sort of winking and nodding at us with this title? 
not really. I think you're going in a lot deeper than I was. I, think I've got to, <laughs> <laughs> I need to credit my editor because my titles are always terrible and always like working titles because they never stick. So I think my title was twinship, like assist, like relationship, a twinship. And uh, uh-huh. everybody was like, that's not a thriller. What are you doing? What are you, what are you talking about, Will? So that was rejected quite rightly. Uh, And Firstborn, yeah, it is intriguing and it is like a dynamic that we're all familiar with. And in this sibling relationship, the um, the age gap is a matter of minutes. But that's still a factor in play. Like one of them still thinks they're the older sister, which I think is interesting. So, yeah, it's um, I I think any family, like all my books are really about family, but. At its most intense uh, level, that is an identical twin relationship, which is not straightforward. That is fasc- it's still fascinating to me now. And like I said, like a lot of things haven't gone in the book that I know about their history. Um, maybe I'll write a short story about them in 10 years time, but it's, it's, it was so interesting going deep into how they were when they were 11 years old at the birthday party or how they were when they were 16 in school. And it's, uh, and one of them like had a boyfriend and the other one was really shy. It's just so interesting how that can shape uh, psychology. Firstborn uh, comes out July 5th. Um, If you are listening to this before July 5th, um, it's just a couple of days. Hang on. You can do it. You can, uh, the book will be out and in your hands in no time. Um, we're going to put links to it in the show notes where, where folks can grab it on Amazon or go um, visit your local uh, bookstore, support local books. Um, will, what are you working on now? This is, uh, you know, this has probably been off of your desk for, for a number of months now. The the story bug is, it has got to be uh, bugging you again now. Yeah, I'm working on my third standalone, which will come out next year, and it is a book which I've really enjoyed writing. Um, it's I can give you the overall concept just in like a quick uh, sure one sentence. So it's about a a woman who's 50. She goes off on an ocean liner, like a like a cruise ship that crosses the Atlantic with her new partner. And they have an evening together on the ship. It's the first time she's ever been on a ship like this. And there's like 1,400 people on board, quite luxurious. And she's a bit kind of fish out of water. And she's there with her new partner and they have kind of an argument on the first night. It's a little bit awkward. And they go to bed, she wakes up, he's not there beside her. So she starts looking around the cabin on the balcony. He's not there, he's not in the bathroom. She walks out into the corridor. All the other cabin doors are open. There's nobody there. She walks out into the main kind of structure of the ship on deck, on the bridge. There's nobody on the ship. She is all alone, steaming into the mid-Atlantic. Oh, oh, oh. I can't wait. I can't wait. Um, <laughs> will, when that new book comes out, will you come back and, and let's talk about it? That would be my pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Uh, the first, or excuse me, Firstborn, uh, July 5th, put it on your must-grab list for this summer. You won't, uh, you won't regret it, I promise. Will, always fun catching up with you. Uh, thank you for taking time to come on the show. Thank you so much, Hank. Uh, my pleasure. You take care.